quando um turista visita Paris, Lisboa ou Londres, vem logo uma imagem à cabeça, um ícone. A Torre Eiffel, o Big Ben ou a Torre Belém. Curiosamente, aqui em Goa, as coisas passam-se de uma forma diferente. A primeira visita que se faz quando aqui se chega é decisivamente a cidade de Old Goa. Mas que ícone representa Old Goa? Será a Sé Catedral, a figura enigmática de São Francisco Xavier, o pôr do sol lá em cima na Capela do Monte? É sobre estes ícones que vos vamos falar neste programa. E o nosso ponto de partida é Nova Goa. Nova Goa que não é mais do que a capital de Goa, Panjim. Aliás, há uma grande confusão. Old Goa, Goa Velha, Nova Goa. É interessante porque faz um triângulo perfeito. De Nova Goa a Old Goa são 10 km, de Old Goa a Goa Velha são mais 10 km e dali de volta fecha o triângulo e são outra vez 10 km. A melhor maneira de viajar aqui em Goa é de facto o autocarro. Passam sempre 10 em 10 minutos. E é super barato. São 5 rupias, devem ser cerca de 7 cêntimos. Olha, já vem um autocarro. Até já. Viajar de fato de autocarro é a melhor opção que tenho. Os autocarros estão sempre a passar 10 em 10 minutos. É uma forma também de... de conhecer melhor o ambiente, as pessoas. Tenho aqui um rapaz aqui ao pé de mim, já estive a perguntar, ele também vai para o outro boa como eu. a Old Goa, antigamente conhecido como Velha Goa, simplesmente ela. Há dois momentos emblemáticos nesta cidade-museu. A Sé Catedral, que foi construída com o intuito de ser a maior igreja da Ásia, e a Basílica de Bom Jesus, onde se encontram os restos de São Francisco Xavier. Mas há um monumento ainda mais interessante, que é as ruínas de Santo Agostinho, onde dizem encontrar-se alguns dos ossos da rainha Catevan, rainha da Georgia. Sigam. Aqui do meu lado direito vai aparecer a Sé. E exatamente do lado oposto temos a Basílica de Bom Jesus. Aqui na Basílica de Bom Jesus se encontra o corpo de São Francisco Xavier. São Francisco Xavier, que é um santo adorado por todos os goeses, independentemente da sua religião, e que eles chamam carinhosamente Goen Saib, o nosso santo goês. Desde 
Modesto Alto assistiu a Afonso de Albuquerque em 25 de novembro de 1510 à Reconquista de Goa. One third of the tower, which you see standing, it is around 46 meters. Now, what about the remaining part? As you know, in 1834, there was a decree passed by the Portuguese, where they had passed a decree that all the orders should be banished from Old Goa, but subsequently went and came back. But the Augustine in which we are occupying this premises did not come back. And since it is a very massive construction and it occupied a large area, it need maintenance. So slowly, because of vagaries of nature, because of rain, because of vegetation growth, it slowly started collapsing. And then in, 18, in 1931, part of the facade, main facade, came down. So you can see two materials that have been used. One is the raw material proper, which is of laterite. And then this is the basalt which they have used, which they must have got from Basin near Maharashtra. You see the raw material. Mm -hmm. It looks completely eroded, weathered, exfoliated, and a lot of cavities have formed. Because this was covered with lime plaster. If you cover the lime plaster, cover the core with the lime plaster, it is protected from the vagaries of nature, the rain, the monsoons, the wind and the saline activities. But since this covering was removed or it got weathered, the inner core was exposed and a lot of vegetation growth took place, the trees, the bushes, which is quite evident from our old, old photographs. And now you see even this laterite, this laterite is not a stone. Laterite is nothing but a compact earth in which the silica has been leached away and the solid nodules of iron and aluminum content is exposed which gets uh, solidified and that is used for its construction. I wonder how you have a picture how this used to look? Yes, we have got some photographs. We have some photographs, photo but the photographs are only of the facade. But we don't have the photographs of how the church looked. This was completely covered with debris of laterite, of bricks, of lime plaster. So, 20 years back, we started this work in, say, 1988. Why we started the work is very interesting because that was because of a request from a country, Russia, then Soviet Union, who wanted to trace the relics of the saint from Georgia which was part of the Soviet Union. Because of their request, our predecessors in 1988 started excavating. They still, you can feel the magic in this place. Isn't it bigger than the Cathedral? Yes. It is a very large uh, uh, dwelling, the church, the convent. And what you see right up till there, you can see the extent of the convent. That's not it. Even across the road, you had an over uh, land bridge which crossed the street and went across and that was called the College of Popolo. So you had a seminary, you had a college where people were trained and the Augustinians had a very big construction and it was one of the headquarters of their Augustine order here. So what we are excavating, we are getting many ceramics, potsherds, nails, but we are not getting the other uh, furniture, church furniture in this complex. Why? When this church went into disuse, there is a record in the archives and there is an inventory of all the goods that were there in the church and it has been shifted to different places. So all that has been made, an inventory has been made. The most classical example is the bell. The bell from the bell tower from here went to uh, the lighthouse at Aguada and now it pales from the Penjim Church, Lady of Immaculate. So, oh, whenever, so it came from here? Yeah, it came from here. So whenever you hear the clang, it is the Augustinian ruins which are speaking through the 
bell in Punjab. Now you see all this. You cannot stop this mm -hmm. writing on the wall, which we call it vandalism, but these people think they are leaving their record behind. This is a universal problem. It happens all over. So this was the question. Yeah. Now that reminds me of a movie, a film, was which was made in seven, 1975. It's a very famous film, a film starring a uh, comedian called Mahmood. He is very much known in Indian context. So his movie was shot here. A story of ghosts. A story where the ghost is running and there is a spirits and uh, all the same was shot. So we are in a place which we I sometimes laugh and we were seeing that movie during when we were a child. We used to get scared. And now I am standing here excavating the site and trying to find out what was there below that. If you can see that movie you will come to know as to this full area was completely full of debris with trees and... This must be real scary in the night with all these ghost stories that you hear. Well, not scary in the sense. It looks very good if you come here. If you have a strong mind, if you don't think of ghosts when you are coming here, you really enjoy. Especially in the evening, it's just very lovely and even if you have a full moon. Our intention here was not to discover or identify or work on the hypothesis of this Russian queen as they are, as it was called then. We just wanted to open this area so that the more people can visit and we will study the ground plan of this area. We were excavating, we came down, we came across this tombstone, a coat of arm having a knight, a tree, Manuel de Sequera de Imatos, Almeida. It's reading which was done by our, one of our exchange student from Portugal. When he read this thing, since he knew about, he, he was doing his thesis for his masters and he had read about this romantic story about the Queen Keta, one of Georgia and all the related stories. He said, okay, I've got some clue. Maybe I've read this inscription in some document. So, went to the documents of Silver Eagle, which is published in 12 volumes. In the 12th volume, this tombstone is described and this describes not only these tombstones but it describes six other tombstones which are there on the windows and in one of the window, that is the second side on the epistle or the window, it mentions that the remains of the Georgian queen should be there. So that was a big discovery because no one knew that the remains of the Georgian queen will be within the monastery or within this convent. They were always thinking that it could be on the second window of the main chapel. But I don't understand from so far how she came here. Yes, that's very interesting. Now, let's go back in time. 1614, Shah Abbas I was ruling Persia, Iran. And Queen Ketewan and her son Tamuros were ruling in Georgia. The Shah Abbas won in, in, in 1614, conquered Georgia, captured the queen and kept her imprisoned in Iran at a place called Shiraz. So, he, the Shah Abbas one wanted to, the queen to convert to Islam. So, if she had converted to Islam, it is understood that the whole of Georgia becomes Islamic. So, when the queen was asked to confess change her religion to Islam, she resisted. She did not oblige him and she did not become part of the harem. So, in 1624, the king put her to death. And it is said that one year before her death, in 1623, two friars, the Augustan friars, went to Iran to establish a mission, Augustan mission. And she became the confessor to one of the friar. So, when she was put to death in 1624, he exhumed the remains after six months and he sent majority of the remains back to Tbilisi, Georgia. Some went, was from there they were sent to Rome 